It's my privilege to welcome you this morning from sunny Bendigo. Let's welcome Dan Cox for another in his uh, jewellery making session. So welcome, Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, it was sunny this morning. The clouds have well and truly come over. <laughs> and uh, no expense spared this morning. We've got a lovely soundtrack. We've got magpie, magpies in the, uh, in the background so accompanying your jewellery making exploits this morning. Yes, well, I hope I hope they haven't just left. <laughs> that's always a way. You never work with uh, children or animals. <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah. Oh well. Anyway. Never mind. <laughs> I'll be around. Yeah. So yeah. this morning, Dan, we're uh, talking about um, using burrs to create texture and layers. Do you want to just explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, so this was a follow on from, um, uh, I just did a week up at the University of Southern Queensland Winter School and we worked on um, using burrs in our uh, creating the image. So actually using different layers of materials and then using burrs to create foregrounds, textures, backgrounds, uh, blend things in um, to each other. Uh, also with uh, titanium painting, um, uh, with heat treating uh, and working with, um, I suppose, birds a different way where a lot of people haven't really kind of experimented with, um, you know, even down to using brownies and greenies in a different way so that they're creating more of a texture than they are just for polishing. Because I think a lot of people, uh, you know, experience these things for just particular things like setting burrs just for settings and brownies just for brownie, uh, for polishing. So your initial polish, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is designed to really kind of make you look at uh, how you can use a burr, but use it in a different way and actually do a little bit of experimenting. And then that adds extra depth and dimension to um, your pieces, hopefully. No worries. Now, what sort of variety of burrs will we need for what we're going to do today? Um, so I use a whole variety of burrs. So I use um, tapered fisher burrs. I use um, heart burrs. I use ball burrs a lot. Uh, so if I'm doing engraving and practicing the actual engraving technique of, um, uh, you know, the right words and such, um, or if I just want... Um, you know, I want to create like a night sky with titanium and, and color that. And then I want to have some bright stars. I'll use um, a ball burr with that. Um, and then I also use, uh, you can get some really good textures out of broken drill bits and, um, and then using the brownies and the greenies, uh, mainly the brownies will give you a really interesting uh, texture on pretty much everything because it has that, that grit. Uh, and then you've got different um, things that you can use in regards to your um, your steel brushes as well that you can also incorporate. And then you've got, you know, these lovely kind of Brillo pad style ones as well that you can use that create a nice little um, matting finish. Uh, so trying to use burrs and different brushes and all these different things to try and throw it all in and and create, you know, something which is more than just a flat polished piece of metal. Yeah, uh, excellent. Anyway, I'm sure we'll be exposed to a number of your little techniques today. So uh, yes. look forward to that. And uh, good morning to uh, a couple of our viewers. We've got uh, Gail and uh, Abbo on the board and welcome to the others who are there as well. And okay, Dan, where are we going to start this morning? Okay, so um, I'm going to probably start with um, just a ball burr. So the ball burrs, um, you know, they're just that nice round uh, burr. They come in a variety of sizes and um, I would suggest getting a variety of sizes. And I think you can also get a pack, which is a variety of sizes as well. So that'll kind of, if you got one of those packs, that would kind of um, cover you really. Um, depending on the amount of detail that you're wanting to get you might even want to go a little bit finer so that you can uh, create some really fine lines in everything that you're doing as well um, and so i just use um, either just a little bit of scrap material so i've got these uh, aluminium cut discs uh, that i can use as well but i also have here some um, colored titanium and um, 
that might work quite nicely for um, you know creating an, a night sky here you can see that I've just uh, hit it with the torch in the center just to try and see what kind of um, difference it does but I'm going to uh, you know come in with some burrs and show you how that works both on the colored titanium and then I have some um, plain titanium as well uh, so this hasn't been polished or colored as yet the edge has been polished you can see that's nice and shiny um, but uh, I want to show you how the burr can actually work on both of those different pieces um, as I said I have the aluminium piece here and then I also have um, just some kind of scrap copper that I use and um, it's just good to experiment with the different materials before you kind of go into using um, you know silver perhaps you'll get a very similar finish across all the materials that you're going to use so this is a really good way of just being able to kind of go okay well um, you know, I want to kind of add a little bit more to this piece. Uh, how am I going to do that? Why don't I use burrs? And that might be the best way to, to do that. Um, so rather than just cut out polished shapes, let's get into something a little bit more exciting than that. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with the ball burr uh, and I'm just going to kind of create a few um, textures with it. So there is a texture which is called a hammer texture. I might go for a slightly larger burr for this only because it'll make it easier probably for everybody to see. I'll just uh, answer a question on uh, Facebook Live. Uh, Rob has asked, is this live? So just to let you know, Rob, yes, this is live and welcome. Totally live. <laughs> the action is happening, actually. Just bear with me. I just need to plug one thing in so that we can be being live. <laughs> <laughs> that will fail. There we go. Now we have power. We're all good. Um, all right. So, all right. So when you run a burr, um, the important thing with the burr is, uh, especially like with a ball burr, um, and if it has, um, you don't want to use a wax burr per se because the teeth are too separated. You want to use um, a designated ball burr. Um, the thing with this is that you want the speed to be running on your flexi drive or your micro motor or whatever you're using so that the teeth don't necessarily the metal and then run across the metal because then you get like this chatter line that might be something that you can experiment with um with getting and i'll show you that actually probably on this copper piece first so if i ran this quite slow it's it's going to kind of like rip and run right across and you'll end up getting let's just try and get this now i'm not sure can you see there are like it's going to be shiny isn't it let me just try we and can see it on a certain angle there, we go. We yeah, got it now. there it is yep so um so you don't get a really nice crisp line and you can see uh definitely like over in here there are separated little marks there. And so what's happening is the, the burr is just like bouncing along the metal and that can be an effect that you might want. But if you want a nice clean line, then you're going to need to keep your, your burr running. And then that'll give you a really nice crisp line. So clearly the bigger the burr, the bigger the line is that you're going to get. Um, and also when I'm running the burr, I'm not trying to resist the burr. I'm not pulling back with the burr. I'm actually going with the flow of the burr. So you'll get a smoother line when you do this. So this is a way of being able to do some burr engraving. And what I would recommend is if you got like an indelible marker, like a Sharpie or something, and you drew onto that, onto your sheet or onto your practice sheet, then you could run your burr nice and fast and play around with different sizes so that you can then um, try and do some 
handwriting if you wanted to or some drawing so what we tend to do with our in our workshop what we did and i'm just going to change my burr to a smaller burr this time was um we wanted to create we were doing landscape so we wanted to create something which was going to be um uh have like a mountain range in the background and then we wanted to have something that um kind of maybe had a river or uh you know had a line of trees or something like this so if i get one of these markers and i draw a line on here so say we wanted you know we wanted mountains but then we wanted to kind of have a river coming through and in that river we wanted some rocks and i roughly kind of draw you know what i'm thinking of with some water flowing through doesn't have to be a masterpiece but clearly you're going to burr this and make it look pretty <laughs> at the moment you know it's like every piece of jewelry it goes through a car crash stage so this is the car crash stage all right <clears throat> So once again, having the burr run nice and fast. So what I'm going to do is come in and define the rock. Now it is a rock, so I want it to be rough. When I get to the river, I want the river to be uh, nice and smooth. I'm going to do the rock on the inside of the river. So I'm using it to also create a bit of texture, not just the line. So around my uh, bank, my river bank, I'm just going to come in and run the burr so that I'm defining that line. So you notice that I'm running with the burr, I'm not pulling towards me so that it grips too much. So I want that line to be nice and smooth. And then even with any water, you know, you might need to do a little bit of pulling, but then you want to kind of So I'm starting to define the the detail. So I've got my my little rocks in there, and then I've also got a little bit of water going through. And now I want to kind of create a little bit of depth with this. So I'm going to put in some reeds and maybe some trees. So this is going to be the very foreground of my piece. This is uh, where you're putting in all the detail. So after you've cut out maybe you've got like a titanium background which is going to be your your um you know your sky because you can get some beautiful blues and purples out of that so it can look quite uh stunning especially if you spent the time in polishing up titanium if you've never worked with titanium before just give yourself uh time to be able to um you know create a nice smooth finish um and then gently heat it and what you'll find is you'll get a nice gradient of color from yellows through to purples and um that can work really nicely as a as an evening sky that then you could probably cut pieces out of um silver to make mountains or even if you wanted to do copper first and make mountains and then add in some silver in your foreground then um then you would be doing 
all of this burr work. Um, so now I'm going to go in and just create some reeds. Now there's a couple of ways that I could do this. I could use the same ball burr or I could go down to a tapered fisher burr. And the good thing with a tapered fisher burr is it's just a nice sharp point. And that gives you a really fine line. And, you know, when you're doing things like reeds um, and grasses and different things like that, you really want to have a nice um, fine line for that. Good thing is also it doesn't dig into your metal. Um, so the bigger the burr, the chunkier the burr, the more it's going to dig into your metal. That can work really well, especially if you want a really heavy texture in something, um, you know, like a mountain or a rock or, um, you know, something within the landscape that you're creating. But if you want really fine lines, then something like a tapered fish burr where it comes down to a really nice sharp point, you know, works really well to give you that. Um, so even though it's quite fine, I still want to run the the machine quite fast as well. So there's no chance of anything uh, grabbing and pulling in a direction that I don't want it to. What you'll find is this gives you a lot more control because it's not gripping and it's really fine. What I do is I kind of come beyond that line of the bank so that the reed comes into the water and we break up that line of the bank a little bit. I can also use this to kind of define where the rock sits in the water. So I'm just going to come in and do that roughly. Every now and then I press a little bit harder so that I can create maybe some reed tops or some flowers, something like that. And then because it's nice and fine, essentially what you're doing is you're mark making with this so that you're creating something. I'm going to try and get that so that you can see it a little bit better. Maybe I'll put it down this way. Can you? I'm just trying to find my, no, we're in the wrong spot. There we are. We're there. Go that way. <laughs> where, where is the camera? Um, so, you know, I'm creating some really fine, really, really fine lines, but then coming in and kind of being just a little bit heavier. So it's all about creating depth using your burr, both, um, you know, really nice and light to create a light mark through to heavier so that you've got, um, you know, some defined areas within the image. So the rocks need to be a little bit more defined and then the grass is going to be finer. So I'm starting to really kind of like build up an image here and get it a little bit finer. So now I could come in, you know, around the rock a little bit more um, with the water and really kind of get um, some, you know, more depth. You could spend quite a lot of time in preparing your sheet or getting your sheet um, finished to create the image. Sometimes what you need to do is um, you would, you know, you come through and you cut all of this out first, you put it into position with your piece. So if you're soldering layers and sweat soldering layers, you would do that before you came anywhere near mark making a lot of the time um, with these burrs so that you're getting a nice crisp, bright line. Um, I only ever use copper as my practice piece though, because um, it's copper, it oxidizes, it's going to change the look of what, whatever you're working with. Um, you can use copper to, as a color, 
clearly not against the skin. Um, don't suggest ever wearing copper against the skin. It's not going to help you with your arthritis unless you probably eat it. And even then it's probably just going to poison you. So <laughs> don't, <laughs> it's an old wives tale. Um, so I would use copper maybe to kind of give us that, that brownish kind of texture or that brownish color that you need for mountains and, and, and landscape work. Um, and that works really, really well. Uh, but I wouldn't use it if it's going to be sitting against my skin. And then if I am using it, I am, um, maybe sealing it as well, because over time it's going to oxidize and your whole landscape is going to change. And that's fine if that's what you want. Um, but if you really want to kind of preserve that image, I would recommend, um, you know, sealing it somehow. Uh, there's a whole different range of things that you can do color wise and stuff. But um, so I could go in and I could do different kind of, um, you know, textures and stuff with this. Um, if I wanted to like really define the image and make it a really beautiful little landscape. But I'm going to move on from copper and I'm going to show you um, a little bit of work with the titanium because titanium, if you've never worked with the titanium, um, it is quite, um, it's a lot of effort to work with titanium, but um, you know, you can get some beautiful colors out of it. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's nice and strong um hypoallergenic as well but uh it takes a burr really well as as well um i have a range of burrs thankfully that um were given to me um from an old jeweler who was a setter and would just use the burr once and then put it into this container so he oh, wow. ended up giving me a whole bunch of containers of um burrs that he would only use once for setting and i'm like they're still good like because that's, that's he didn't use it for that so um and this is one thing that i've realized over time is you know people see the birds that they've got and different things that they've got and they go okay well this this is only just for this but it's not you can use it for more so on this colored titanium piece uh you know i would uh this is just an experimental piece so um I would probably, if I was coloring this for the purpose of using it for a piece, I would heat from one side. So it would give me a gradient all the way through. So I would get, um, you know, a deeper color through here, wherever your flame is playing through to a lighter color here. So you get more of this uh, yellow that you can see in this. And then um, you can see where my flame has hit that is a bright blue and then it goes through to a dark blue and purple so you can really play with these colors but a burr can work in real contrast to this i will change to a different burr once again so going back to a ball burr for the moment just to show you a little bit of difference all right so I'm just going to do like a hammer texture. Or I could make it more like, you know, a constellation. So when you're using a ball burr and you want it to not skim across the surface, um, you need to give it a little bit of a pull back. So as you're, as you're placing it down, you really want to make sure that you're nice and firm with that placement. Um, that will take practice. You will need to do that multiple times to get it right. And I, I suggest that you practice on each kind of piece of material that you're working with. So whether or not you're working with copper or brass or aluminium or titanium or silver, then I would practice just with the, uh, with the burr. Well, Dan, but, just before you start, uh, Robert has asked, are the ones you're using diamond tip? No, they're not. Um, so these are just um, your your standard burrs that you can get. Um, you don't need to use diamond tip specifically unless, of course, you're working with, um, you know, you want to do some glass engraving or something like that. You could use those clearly underwater um, very carefully. Uh but for titanium, they don't, you don't actually need to uh, have diamond tip. So does that 
help. No, that's great. And uh, Sabine has given you a shout out too, Dan. She obviously Hi. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll just do a little bit more. So that will be difficult to focus on, I suppose. But you can see there's a really strong difference now. So what I've done is I've gone straight through that color line into the titanium uh, so that now you get a nice bright finish of that titanium again. So with this, what I could do is I could heat treat it again. And then essentially what you're doing is you've removed the heat treating from that area. So when you play your flame onto that area, that is a new area of color change. And what you can end up getting, uh, you know, quite randomly, but what you can end up getting are brighter parts, yellower parts against purple parts. Um, so as you go through that color change, those marks that you make on your titanium will change it a different color to where it's already colored. Does that make sense? It does, yeah, yeah. Does. Good. So a yeah. lot of experimentation to find exactly yeah. what's good for you. Yeah. yeah, a lot of playing, which is good. Um, because sometimes you'll be a whole, really surprised yeah. and you go, wow, that's a great uh, result. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then you try to replicate it. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, crap, that didn't work. Um, <laughs> what did I do last time? This is where a visual diary comes in handy, you know. Um, so I've also got heart burrs, and heart burrs are good for creating lines on things. Um, so not only just a a single line. The only problem with a heart burr, I suppose, is because it's that, you know, you've got that edge of the heart burr, uh, and that's really where you're playing. So that, that edge is the thing that's going to cut that line for you. Um, so depending on the piece that you're working on will depend on where you hold it. I clearly wouldn't be able to probably get a, I would still get a line here, but it'll be a slightly different line because my titanium is hitting my hand piece. So I want to back it off a little bit. But the interesting thing with the heart burr is you've got the line, which will be nice and thin, but then when you go to uh, go across with the burr rather than along with the burr, you open up a broader line. So this can work really well. These burrs can work really well for engraving, um, you know, words essentially, because you get that lovely kind of script, old script kind of look with it where you, um, you know, you start off with a really nice fine line and then it gets bolder and it comes back into a fine line. So I, I recommend a lot of practice with this because it, um, it does take a lot of practice. And I hope that you can see out of that, that you get, you know, I've got this nice fine little line as I go around, it broadens up. And then as I go back into a fine line and then it broadens up again, and again, and then comes back into a fine line. So that can be a lovely little decorative piece to a decorative part to a piece as well. Um, so it's all about, you know, just doing that little bit more that's gonna make your piece a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> now. That yeah, just to practice, uh, Dan, I'm sure that the guy who did the engraving on Ash Barty's uh, Wimbledon trophy uh, clocked up a few hours of practice before he um, was let loose on the actual trophy. Yeah, you hope that, um, was it hand engraved or was it buried? They, they but... hand engraved them, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> this is this is kind of like the poor man's version of engraving, really, because yeah. <laughs> you, know, you don't have gravers and all that kind of stuff going. So, um, yeah, this is like the, the poor man's version of it, but um, you can still get some really, really good results, and it's not just about creating um texture but you can you can write out 
you know, a whole bunch of stuff with this. Um, and it is, it's down to practice. Anything is down to practice, really, especially with, you know, jewellery making. Mm. Um, okay, so the hammer texture that you can get from just hammering, um, I, you can also get it with uh, creating, uh, using a ball burr and uh, making some lovely little designs with that. So I'm just going to quickly do one of those. So the problem here is that I'm going to make it look super easy. But the, the burr wants to skim. And I have to kind of work at stopping that from happening. But maybe that light is a bit light. Let's see. I might turn that light off just for a minute. Let's see if that changes the way that you can see this at all. If I, yeah, I we've got see. a good view there, Dan. Yeah, good, excellent. So um, the weather constantly changes in Bendigo. We just had rain and now <laughs> we're probably going back up to sunshine again. Um, can never keep up. Um, welcome to Victoria. So this, uh, this little, you know, detail that I've created here. So uh, if you use like a ball peen hammer and you want a, a hammer texture, um, that will give you more of a dull kind of finish. Whereas uh, a burr will give you a really nice bright finish. Um, and so this is really quite a, uh, a bright finish because you're cutting that metal and uh, you're cutting into, you know, you're revealing like a fresh surface. Um, so, you know, aluminium and copper and brass, um, you know, really good to experiment on. Uh, your aluminium will probably be closer in colour to your silver. Um, but, you know, as I was saying before, your copper and your brass will oxidise over time. Um, but you can, as I said, you can seal that. But you'll get a really lovely little texture or ball peen kind of finish, hammer texture, out of this but it'll be really nice and bright so this is a good um this is a good way of being able to camouflage mistakes that you might make so if you um are working on a piece and you accidentally make a mark in it and it's going to be impossible for you to be able to get around and go okay so i need to um you know i need to get into that groove or i need to get into where that that um, join is, and then I need to, um, uh, you know, clean up that little bit of solder that you just can't get into with by hand, or you, you know, any of the other little things that you've got aren't necessarily going to be able to get in there. What you can do is you can use texture like this to be able to, uh, and you know, much smaller ball burrs to be able to get in there and create a little bit of a a design around it or create a bit of a texture around it and kind of add to it rather than um, go, oh, well, I'm just going to leave that lump of solder that has kind of sat there. Um, you know, it's going to look, it's going to look ugly. So you want to remove that or you want to change that so you can, especially if you've got little tight areas that there's no way you're going to get anything in there apart from a tiny little ball burr then use it to your advantage and kind of get in there and texture the background and uh, you know nobody's any wiser to any problems that you may have encountered oh, it was meant to be meant that way <laughs> <laughs> that's what i do <laughs> this has all come from experimenting and doing things and going okay well that hasn't worked what am i going to do with that because i don't necessarily want to remake a whole piece when maybe one little area of it, of it hasn't worked. And so then now I incorporate texture and everything, you know, even if I get a beautiful solder line and I get, you know, really nice finish, I get bored with the idea of a highly polished piece. I like to have a contrast between polish and matte and uh, texture. And I think it just adds so much more to a piece than just having it 
highly polished. It's my it's my opinion. I'm sticking more to character. It. Yes, it gives you more character. Um, so I also use uh, brownies. Um, as I was saying earlier, I use brownies as um, a way of being able to create, um, you know, some really lovely texture in a piece. Um, and it gives a nice reflective surface to, um, uh, to your piece that can work quite well once or when again once again also camouflaging it but also like the background the back of pieces so in the week that we did um i got um students to uh use this texture on the back of their piece because whenever you hand somebody a piece of jewelry they're not just going to go oh yeah that's great and hand it back to you they're going to go oh yeah that's nice and they're going to flip it around so if the back is ugly for some reason um or it's not finished or even if it is finished and it's just plain um you know the moment that you highly polish something the moment somebody wears it you know it just ends up starting to get scratched and so i try to avoid having a highly polished back to anything because uh that's when you usually get a client coming back going oh well you know it doesn't look as good as it used to and it's like well no because you've been wearing it you know if you do, if you want it to look pretty don't wear it <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, so um, so using this burr um, can be a really good way, or well, not really a burr, but the polish, um, the brownie, can be a really good way. So this is a bullet, um, or it was a bullet shape. Um, it's been used, but you can do this with the bullets, with the square edge, with the um, with the knife edge ones. There's you know, there's a whole range of them that you can use and they work really, really well. So um, not a huge amount of pressure, but uh, I move the burr around and I do one direction first of all, and then I change direction. But then I leave areas exposed. And I go next to where I've been before. The good thing with this uh, method is that you can just continue to go over and over and over until you're happy with the look. You're not removing that much material that, you know, you're going to end up with nothing to show for it in the end. And because I'm rotating it, what you'll start to see is the light hits it in different ways. And so I work in little patches. So I'm covering the entire back surface to this because then I want to do a little contrast on the edge. All right, so see how that picks up the light in different ways. Great. Yeah, really simple and really, really effective. Like this really? is, yeah, I think I lost a student to the entire morning just playing with this stuff on the week because <laughs> they were like my god this is amazing um so it can, it's super effective uh way better than just a polished background um gives you a lovely little texture and then if you're like coming in on this and you want to maybe sand the edge <clears throat> so that you're chamfering that edge a little bit so i'm just getting that edge nice and smooth 
Then I can come back with my brownie. And when I use a brownie, I use the length, try and use the length of the brownie. So even though I'm going this way, I'm also moving up and down so that I'm not just wearing out one section of my brownie. And I bring that up so that it's showing up at the front a little bit as well. And then I change to a greeny. So what's the difference between the brownie and the greeny? So your brown, so the brownie is think of it as your initial polish. So it's essentially like your, yeah, your initial polish. So your Tripoli, I suppose. Um, it is a silicon bullet. So it is invest, the polish compound um, or the, the grit is invested in the actual bullet. So you don't need to add any polish to this at all. Um, you don't dip it in any polish or, or anything. So it's just um, the brownie that you use first. So that's your initial polish. And then the greeny is much finer and you use that as your secondary or your final polish. And the greeny is designed to give you a really nice high shine. So the edge of that is quite shiny at the moment, but the moment I hit it with the greeny, We can spend quite a bit of time doing this and getting it to a really, really nice finish. But um, that just gives it a really lovely contrast. I hope you can catch that really shiny edge that I've got going on there. Um, so you can imagine that the whole thing is actually done in a nice shiny little rim and that will give you a really good um, you know, contrast between uh, the lovely texture that you've created through to the edge. It just finishes it really, really nicely for you. So, Dan, when you were applying that texture with the brownie, the pattern yep. that you were using, was that totally random or did you have some regularity about that? No, um, I do rather random patterns. So you can, you can go, uh, you know, a little, completely unscripted if you want. So all I was doing is some random patterns, but I was doing it in smaller patches and then moving the disc around and doing smaller patches. Or you could, here's a disc I played earlier. Um, <clears throat> so you could come in and do a much larger section And I'm moving this rather quickly, but I'm rotating it at the same time. So, you know, it's random movement. And then that gives you, um, that'll give you a completely different look, essentially. And so it's where, how the burr hits, and this will happen with any, any of the burrs really, it's how the burr hits uh, the metal as you're working it. It'll pick up light uh, in, you know, different, at different angles. And so you get, uh, you know, this lovely kind of random pattern. So you can imagine that this is quite a, a good way of being able to camouflage areas that you might want to camouflage but it can also work to your advantage and be a part of your piece so the more what i found with doing my work was that i was getting was playing around with the burrs and then i'd get into a especially when i was a student i'd get into certain parts and i'd be like oh no, that didn't look good. So then I would try different burrs of cleaning it up. And then I would be like, okay, well, the polish surface isn't going to work now. So then maybe what I do is I, you know, use the ball burr from point A to point B, but I 
dissipated or something. So then it starts to look like more of a starburst. Um, and then I started to incorporate this into my pieces because I was getting this uh, collection of um, textures that I was playing with and, and learning how to use and what burrs worked really well with all of these things. And then even using broken drill bits and seeing how broken drill bits worked and, and what textures they created. And so then that informed my practice more so than, you know, cause you learn how to polish and you learn, um, you know, your sanding and your polishing and all that kind of stuff and what the finish should be in regards to a high polish or, or that. But, um, as I was saying earlier, I find that pretty boring. I mean, you know, I take things out and smack it against the concrete just to see what kind of texture I get. Um, clearly not in the final stage, but as a texture, I'm looking at, you know, concrete and I'm looking at bricks and I'm looking at um, bitumen and how can I inform and put more into my piece than just a polish. So. Um, the last thing that I kind of want to show you um, is these lovely little bristle uh, brushes, um, these sanding brushes that um, you can also get from AJS. Um, and they come in different um, textures. Uh, even the, um, you know, there's different silicon polishing wheels that you can get. Um, and they, you know, if you're using a rough cart, it's going to give you a texture going to give you a finish um so that's something that i would recommend that you experiment with these come in um various um roughnesses grades of roughness <laughs> um, <laughs> so they work they can work really well um in uh creating uh a texture for you uh not just in as like a matte finish by itself i've got a little bit of aluminium here so we'll play with that. But they oh, yeah. might just... Just before you use that, I'll just... Um, uh, Gail's keen to get some brownies and greenies, so that's great. And uh, Robert just asked, uh, should you normally clean your surface between using your brownie and your greenie? Um, no, so it's not like polish. Uh, the what you If you're going to be using a brownie for an extended period of time, I would recommend wearing a dust mask. Um, uh, because it's not going to cut cover your metal it doesn't cover your metal it just cuts in and you get a fine dust and that fine dust just like with polishing you want to wear a dust mask um so you want to do the same thing with your brownie um your brownies and your greenies uh, but more so your brownie so your brownie what i would recommend is um if you're going to do some texture and stuff with your brownies i'd recommend getting more brownies than greenies because they're a rougher finish um, and a rougher compound and it grinds through them quite quickly. Um, whereas your greenies are denser, therefore give you a higher polish and they're a finer grit. So it's going to be a nice smooth kind of um, finish, but you'll get uh, a longer life out of one of these guys um, because they actually, we'll go back here. There you go. Now you can see it. Um, You'll get you'll get a longer life out of a greenie than you will a brownie. So I would cons I would consider getting more uh, of the brownies and the greenies. You could just give it a wipe in between, and that's fine. Um, but you really you're not going to get a residual. It's not like you'll have residual polish left on your piece between your brownies and your greenies. It's no worries. That's great. Thanks, Dan. Um, that was a long winded explanation. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> All mean, right. So, Robert's still uh, awake. Sorry? Rob, Robert is still awake. He didn't fall asleep during that. Okay, good. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Um, okay, so. So this gives you a uh, like a satiny type finish. Mm -hmm. um, so this can work really well if you're wanting to 
like we use it to create clouds or atmosphere essentially so um i'm very much inspired by asian design which you probably can tell from the piece of copper that um you know that landscape is rather asian in its look um so i do a lot of that kind of artwork um <clears throat> So this can work really well as creating mist. You could use it for the surface of water. You could use it for um, clouds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or you could just use it for uh, a little bit of light play as well. So a nice satiny kind of finish. I use burrs in various directions rather than just constantly in the one direction because most of my work is, is that, I suppose. Um, but you know, this can, if you're nice and light with it, it can just add a nice little light hint. Um, but if you're uh, heavy handed with it, then you'll get, uh, you know, more of this digging into the metal, which is, you know, handy, um, depending on the kind of look that you're trying to create. Uh, likewise, and you can see how worn this is, um, with the steel, the steel brushes, they can work to the same degree as to cleaning up your um, your material. So you can clean your surface after, you know, you've put it into the pickle and you need to clean up a certain area. You can use one of these for that, but you can also use one of these if you hold it for long enough in a particular spot, it will dig into your metal and it will, um, you know, create a texture as well. Uh, definitely highly recommend that you wear safety glasses when using these ones because the little pieces of steel, as you can tell, because it looks like it's been through the ringer, it has, um, because it loses these little steel bits. So your brass brush and your steel brush will do that. Um, I prefer the steel brush to the brass brush only because it's that little bit um, tougher and you can use it quite gently to remove all the fr the you know the frosting that you get from a piece um without getting a brass finish on it but also you can use it to create a texture so you can actually hold it in a spot and it will dig and i'll show you that very quickly hopefully this worn one will do it and I'm well, Dan, just before you do that Steph just asked what was that purple one called oh um I like they're they're like a Brillo pad, um, but um, I'm not sure what you guys would have them listed as because I I get these all from um, from AJS. So um, uh, yeah, I would have to get back to you on that one. I'm not 100 yeah, sure. It's like a Scotch bright on wheels. Yeah, like a Scotch bright. Yeah. <laughs> if you said I want a Scotch Scotch bright wheel. <laughs> they'll probably get what you're talking about. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, uh, some people use um, uh, the mandrels where you can uh, exchange things where you can, you know, they've got the little screw on the end and you can unscrew that, take off whatever you're working with and, and then put a fresh one on. Some people painstakingly take the time to create their very own texture mops as well or you can just buy one. So, um, you know, it depends. So I'm just gonna position this out of my, uh, so if anything flicks off it, it's not flicking towards me, it's flicking away from me and we'll see what this does. So it certainly cleans my metal. But then, let me position that so that hopefully you can see it. It's starting to see how there's that really kind of rough surface happening. So that's actually kind of melting the metal a little bit uh, and like digging really um and that's what 
you know, it could work quite nicely for some type of texture, depending on what you're working at. These can either be finished textures or you can do a polish after them if you wanted to and see how it goes. But once again, it all comes down to experimentation and seeing what works for you. This is just a little introduction for you. Indeed. 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 <laughs> so there's a couple of different um, things happening there. Um, hopefully that, ex you know, that, uh, gets you thinking about burrs in a different way and not just buying a burr for the sake of, you know, the purpose of what it, you're buying it for, like, uh, you know, um, a ball burr for maybe setting or something like that. It can also be used for, for textures and, um, and creating more of an image in your pieces rather than just, um, you know, polish, I'm trying to make you think of other things yeah. than polish. No, I'm sure you've got people thinking outside the square there, Dan. So good. Excellent. And uh, experimenting <laughs> yes. and finding things that you like and seeing how you can incorporate that into future pieces. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Steph did just ask, uh, was your piece getting hot then when you were working with it with that steel brush? Uh, it does start to warm up. Um, so I suppose it will depend on the size of the piece that you're working with, but it does actually start to warm up after a little while. So um, I would just you know, um, put it down and come back to it really. Uh, also be aware of where the edge of your piece is as well, because you don't, um, you know, if you've got a brush and then you've got the very edge of your, of your piece, you might want to turn it around. So you're coming from the other direction rather than having your brush flick over that edge, because that is where it's going to flick out of your hand or, um, you know, you'll, it'll, it'll wrap around that edge. So you've got to be aware of what you're doing or sit it on a flat wooden block or something like that so that it's nice and secured. Um, and you can have the burr or the brush or whatever you're working with run along the surface. And if it hits the wood, it doesn't matter because the difference is very, you know, minimal try and protect yourself as much as possible. Indeed, you've got to anticipate the things that could go wrong. Absolutely, yes. Safety glasses, dust masks, wooden blocks, make a jig or something like that. So it's just, just you don't have things flying across the room or you know, doing damage to yourself. No, indeed. Okay, Dan, well, we'll uh, wrap it up there, but really uh, appreciate your insights into uh, texturing this morning and finding different uses for our burrs. Awesome. Uh, we'll see what if there's any comments or questions coming through. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, uh, Avo said thanks for sharing, Dan. Uh, Gail, that was great. Thanks, Dan. So uh, we really appreciate having the audience. And uh, Dan, we'll look forward to seeing you again real soon. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.